Good morning, everyone. So M2 Exchange has rapidly gained attention since its launch, positioning itself as a strong contender in the cryptocurrency market. Today, I'm joined by Stefan Kimmel, the CEO of M2 Exchange. Stefan, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Willie. It's a pleasure to be on the show as usual. Uh, yeah, as, as usual is a, is a nice thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, is, this was the promise that we have to, to check up on you every, every day and then. So let me start, Stefan, with the latest announcement you have uh, made earlier. So UAE residents uh, to buy and sell Bitcoin and Ethereum directly to, through their bank accounts. So my question, why now and what was the case in the past months? So look, I mean, the, the, we had planned, to be honest, to launch that a bit earlier. Um, of course, to do this right and to, to do it secure, uh, we had to be sure that all the, the right licenses and safeguards and, and, and prerequisites are in place. That uh, is the case now. So we're very happy that we finally got there and we can offer the service to our clients. So uh, is, it, is it a PR thing? Like we're saying BTC and ETH only, or, or this is your pairing with AED only, your, your pairing with uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum or other crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies as well? So um, that, that has to do with our, with our um, li licensing model in the group. Um, we have under the ADGM license, which is our local license in the UAE, um, we trade the Durham-based pairs, so the AD pairs. We're starting that with uh, BTC and ETH, um, more, more planned in, in due course very shortly. Um, we have another roughly 80 or 90 pairs on the M2 platform um, in the wider group as well. So any, any customer onboarding, can make use of the entire spectrum of our services, including the earned plans, including all the other products we have. Well, since uh, since uh, November last year, uh, can you share some key metrics about user growth and trading volume during this period? Yeah, so look, I mean, it's, it's really picked up predominantly in the last three, four months uh, when let's say the excitement in the crypto market was was so, so much bigger with the Bitcoin price going up and, and the ETFs being launched and halving. So it's a very positive momentum um, um, in the market right now. So we, we, we're seeing about 30 to 40 percent growth month on month uh, on our mm -hmm. user base. I think we have about a bit over half a billion uh, USD uh, assets under management on the platform now. Um, so it's it's growing nicely as expected. We see the biggest uptake, uh, not even just in trading. We see that predominantly for our earned plans. Um, that's that's really a flagship product. What customers customers seek when they come on into um, that's for instance the the nine percent interest we pay on Bitcoin. Uh, same on ETH. We pay we currently have a special with Ton where we pay ten percent, um, and that's that's what customers seek predominantly when they come on into. Other than than obviously the, the pure trading side of things. Fully agree. So, so uh, Steph, before before our our call, uh, Stefan, I was reading a report about uh, hacks and crypto scams. So the past six months weren't easy at all in the industry. Interesting mm -hmm. to say that regulation and regulator oversight saved somehow users' money or clients' money. Uh, but it, this wasn't the case with areas with non-regulated platforms so uh because interestingly i'm following was uh, case so uh, so what's your uh, comment on that or uh, takeaways yeah look i mean i, I think from the perspective of, of potential attackers naturally they, they would go after the easiest targets first rather than to to try the, the hard and challenging ones and at least those of us who are regulated by strict regulators, such, such as the ADGM, they are, have a very high standard, um, not only on compliance, but also on, on safeguarding client assets. Um, and of course, that makes us a much, much harder target. Yeah, to, uh, to I, don't, I don't want to say that it didn't happen. It happened for, for no. a platform operating under ADGM, but somehow the, 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 the client accounts were somehow saved and uh, refunded safely. I think that the case you're referring has one partial license in ADGM, but the main license somewhere else <laughs> without, get, without getting into, into the specifics. No, but look, I mean, you're right. I mean, of course, attacks happen. They happen in TradFi as well as in, 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 uh, in crypto. Uh, typically in DeFi, 
there's much, much easier targets or in unregulated exchanges, there's typically easier targets than the regulated ones. Doesn't mean anything is 1000% sure. There's no such thing in real life as a, an absolute guarantee, but at least, you know, the, the, the standards are industrial grade and, and as high as they can be to safeguard client assets, including cold storage, uh, including, um, you know, cyber protection layers, many, many layers of that. So there's a lot of effort going into making sure everything's absolutely safe. Yeah, and this is this safety uh, procedure, or at least to to comfort people, because because whenever we're talking about M two, we're talking about people looking to earn interest. So the assets is at M two custody. So it's it's always good to to highlight how. What are the security measures M2 is taking and uh, uh, if everything is in place? So uh, uh, earlier uh, last month, I was I had a nice uh, interview and uh, actually it was a demo on, on a deep fake, um, the use of AI deep faking the, the onboarding process. Uh, and I was literally afraid and scared because somehow the guy and I didn't I didn't broadcast this but the guy yeah. was interviewing me so he show he show himself as myself so uh, what, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so what are the measures that you're taking as as an exchange to to really overcome this challenge that is growing and growing uh, tremendously uh, and already hit it uh, hit uh, hard on the TradeFi platform, yet still not that much on, on the crypto platform, but uh, um, how, what's the plan for this? Yeah, look, that's, you're absolutely right. That's, a, that's an increasing challenge in terms of identity theft, identity um, uh, you know, simulation uh, with, with AI, because that's getting awfully good, as you rightfully said. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, some, somebody aired a, a podcast interview with me the other day in Urdu and Arabic, uh, <laughs> so, so it looked like I speak fl fleecent, uh, fluent, fluent Urdu. Um, so, so what we do is, is a couple of things. Of course, um, our onboarding process, uh, to, to answer your question, has multiple layers. It's, it's not just the video screening, that's just a liveliness check, um, especially in the UAE, for instance, we connect it straight to, to UAE Pass. Um, so we, we check documents from the source, we verify phone numbers, we, we do several layers of identification including documents um, to make sure we check all possible boxes to ensure the person is really who he says he is um, that's that's one aspect but at the same time we're working together with with some of the in, in, industry leading uh, players and support companies uh, that build those solutions to detect uh, ai fakes and and constantly make sure we stay on the forefront of that effort and it's a challenge as you said be it TradFi, be it crypto, everybody is getting the head around how to prevent it. Um, uh, but we, we are sure we work with the best in the industry to make sure we stay at the forefront of this. So, Stefan, I want to go back a little bit to something maybe you won't like uh, much to talk about, but let me, uh, maybe it's good to clarify this. So, banks in, gen in general are, are not keen or not excited uh, to to uh, to take the risk uh, to carry the risk of digital assets in general, and I've been I've been seeing this every day in the market. I mean, starting from exchanges, uh, somehow they are not announcing where's the client money account is, and uh, banks are not, are forbidding them to do this. Uh, um, from the other end, uh, some users or traders uh, having their account blocked. Uh, whenever they receive money from exchanges and so on. So with the announcement that you've made and talking about the word integration exactly, so so how do you see banks in the UAE, how uh, the on-ram off-ram activity is still, I don't want to say it's a challenge, it is something that uh, banks are not really keen to go into that path yet. Do you end with this statement first? Yes, I mean, look, look. Traditional finance or banks are, are cautious, cautiously observing it, and, and it has a lot to do with the history. I mean, if, if we if we wind back time two three years, the the news out there about crypto weren't exactly great. I mean, it's, we have to be honest about that that as well. And in most jurisdictions, um, regulation also wasn't so clear. 
Um, and of course, as a bank, if I onboard a client, I have to follow my own regulation. I have to comply with the central bank uh, regulation that's overseeing me and have to make sure I, I have full visibility and understanding control of what my customers do on, on, on with my accounts. So to the extent crypto was an unclear beast to the banks, that there was a risk they can't easily take on. Um, just purely putting myself in their shoes, also having been a banker my, myself. Um, I, I think it's gradually and slowly changing just because the acceptance, the broad acceptance of crypto is growing globally. The political acceptance, if you look at the US debates right now, all of a sudden becomes pro-crypto. Regulation in, in, in Europe is becoming clearer in the US, still early days, but I think that the tides are shifting um, in the right direction. We have UAE with one of the oldest regulations. We have Hong Kong, Singapore, all moving in that direction. So I think with more and more clarity, certainty, there's clear rules for crypto exchanges. It's clear who the good players are and the not so good players that, that's being weeded out or has been weeded out to, to quite an extent over the last few years. I, I think banks are at least re revisiting the, uh, this still cautiously, rightfully so. You know, as, as a bank, you have to be cautious. You have to be uh, certain that you're not taking on a risk you can't control or understand. So it's 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 still cautious, but I, I see a slight slight step by step movement in in hopefully the right direction. So on on June twenty uh, fifth, the central bank issued the stable coin regulations. My question, my first question on this is, is is it what you've been looking for as an exchange? or maybe as a crypto leader. My second question on this, how do you forecast the effect of this regulation on the regional crypto market? So uh, first of all, I think it's good that we have uh, a regulation. I'm, I'm always a, a fan of having that clarity. That's that's in any case, good or bad regulation is always better than no regulation. No regulation is the worst, so that's one. No, I think by and large is, is what, what we would have expected, what we see in other uh, jurisdictions as well. Uh, we, we'll have to see also how it's being lifted and, and, and enforced uh, in practice. There's always, you know, that, that gap, what's on paper and, and how will we actually see it in action. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's another good step uh, for the UAE and, and the region as putting ourselves at the forefront of the crypto space, um, as we've done in, in many other areas. It's, it's already the case with the, the regulations in place, both ADGM and VARA. Uh, with a lot of players in the industry, a, a good ecosystem. That, that's 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 why I think the UAE specifically is at the absolute forefront, and the the stablecoin regulation is the next step in that direction. Because I had I had to write I had to write a clarification. We met uh, the central bank twice, and uh, I had to write a clarification on both regulation because somehow it was it was misunderstood from the market. Uh, Frankly speaking, it was badly written from 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 the lawyer uh, and uh, not from the law itself. So uh, uh, for me, I didn't expect it to be uh, different. So I didn't, and specifically, they call it like payment token. For them, it is a mean of payment, and for a mean of payments, they need the full visibility on on uh, on what's happening on the ground for different purposes, starting from FATF to 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 uh, to other limitation they have. Uh, but the crypto market didn't take it like like that positive the way you are you are taking it. Somehow, there's a lot of um, like maybe there's a lot of expectations, and uh, they didn't they didn't manage to manage their expectation from to start with. Right. So now, now look, looking into what's happening in Switzerland on 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 stablecoin regulation, we are I believe we are by far uh, doing uh, doing better. I I'd agree. I mean, look I mean, for starters, any regulation will never ever satisfy all of all of crypto. Um, and depending on how far you are on the on the libertarian scale, of course, you'd like minimal or no overview uh, control over the movement of assets and in terms of privacy expectations, etc. So any regulation that's being issued will always see, see some pushback from the industry. That's to be expected. And I, I think that the regulators are, are very aware of that as well. No, but I think from what could have been expected, I, I, I see it in the right place. Yeah.
So uh, going back to to the halving topic, so so uh, we lived uh, the moment waiting, expecting the halving. So people were expecting <laughs> Bitcoin to fly and to uh, to to double in a couple of weeks, but somehow it didn't happen. So uh, price is still uh, still not moving that fast and. Uh, and I know that you you will not comment or you will not say what uh, how do you see uh, Bitcoin and uh, Bitcoin prices. This is not you, but uh, somehow halving didn't do much on pricing. Uh, so why is that? And uh, what do you expect on uh, Bitcoin pricing? So look, I mean, if I look at everything that happens this year um, from a positive side. I think halving is probably the smallest contributor. Uh, we had much, much bigger, and still have coming up, much, much bigger um, drivers for for Bitcoin price and, and, and macro environment. We had the the ETFs early in the year that are that are incredibly significant. Not only because um, of the potential market cap of the ETFs themselves, but also because the signal that sent to the broader industry and the acceptance it has created. If if you if you recall a few years back, all of the U.S. capital uh, market establishment was all um, very anti-crypto, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was considered something that's only there for money laundering and and, and cybercrime, etc. Now all of a sudden you have BlackRock and Larry Fink, you know, being an out outspoken proponent of crypto. They're running na national TV ads for for Bitcoin, yeah, once and and. The, the credibility that adds, and now the the latest one of his Donald Trump uh, being on, on Bitcoin twenty twenty four, given a one and a half one and a half hour keynote speech. Both, both, both candidates were there, and they they are giving promises right, left, and center. Yeah. So, and I think that from a macro environment and from a broad acceptance of the established big institutional money, um, is a much much bigger contributor. And then you have. Uh, obviously, potentially, everybody's expecting now the the um, quantitative easing to to start probably in September. Um, didn't happen yesterday; it was two nights ago. Uh, but it's most likely uh, everybody's expecting at least. For, whether it's September or November doesn't really matter. The point is, after two years uh, of quantitative tightening, we're now starting the easing again, and that will have a tremendous impact on crypto as as a risk asset. So, if I look at the bigger picture and everything that's happening. That, that makes me very bullish about Bitcoin and the crypto industry. I think having is probably the smallest contributor. Yeah, I to your point on time, the point on timing, perhaps. I, I think historically the evidence was that the real driver, the real uptake after halving was typically about 100 days after halving. So we, we're just entering that space. So anybody who would expect it on the day after halving for it to shoot up, is probably a bit over ambitious. Actually, who went long on the day of halving? Went went bust. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was a, it. Was a difficult. The last three months were difficult, right? Yeah. I mean, despite all the. But that's that's the other thing, and I, I tweeted about that just the other day. There's the long term bullish outlook, right? And and if you if you don't take on huge risk, but you just sit there buy and hold, you can probably ride it out. Yeah. But if you then go along with a big leverage, and uh, there's there's the dips in between, and that, that is the risk people take. Absolutely. So, uh, looking ahead, uh, uh, Stefan, what is M2 Exchange long-term vision now after this development in the market? Uh, can you elaborate on your plans for expansion into new markets, potential products offering, or strategic partnership? Yeah, so look, uh, throughout the, the, the M2 group, um, we are about to launch several new products very, very soon, waiting also for, for final touches on it. It's the our crypto loans so we, we do we we'll start a loan program we can lend uh, assets against your crypto holdings uh, we are about to launch payment cards we have a revamp of our, our trading features as a next generation um, which a lot with a lot of new capabilities that we're very excited about so the, the product roadmap is pretty packed and then at the same time we're looking at uh, strengthening our international footprint um, we are uh, at the final stages of opening our, our spanish branch uh, we're filing for registrations in, in several other countries like India, Taiwan, um, um, and South Korea. Um, so, this is new. Uh, for me. Yeah, no. Look, I mean, our, our plan was always wherever we expand, wherever we go, we want to do that in a, in a clear and regulated uh, manner. 
So, um, so you don't think Spain as a Mika kind of station? Yeah, so I'm with Mika, but we'll 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 go all the way to Mifid too, uh, because we have a pretty rich product offering, and, and Mika alone wouldn't cover as a license a scheme mm -hmm. wouldn't cover all the activities you want to do. So we'll, we'll do that based on a, Mika, on a Mifid two license. Amazing. So, oh, ladies and gentlemen, this was the Stefan Kemal. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Willie.